here this morning with us to fellowship, to magnify, to lift up the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He has kept us thus far, 22 days into this new year. So we have come this morning to lift him up, to magnify his name, to give him praise, glory, and honor. As the song says, I love you, Jesus. We have come to worship and adore you like never before. So this morning, as we go before the Lord, whatever it is that you might be in need of, whatever it is that you may be lacking, the Lord knows, he sees, he hears, and he cares. Whatever tears you may be crying in secret, he sees, and your tears are not going in vain because he cares for you. So this morning, as we come before him, just let him rest upon your hearts and your spirit. Whatever burden you may have come in with, know that you will not leave from this place the same. That his redeeming power is here to transform, to renew, and to make you new again in our lives. So God, we just magnify you. Can you just magnify him this morning? Give you the glory. Thank him for all that he has done. 22 days and thus far. 22 days he has kept us in our right mind. We are here clothed. We thank you, God. We thank you that we're moving forward and that we love and like what our future looks like. We thank you, Lord. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we magnify you. We give you praise, honor, and glory. We ask that this morning that your Holy Spirit would rest like never before in this place. Fill every, every area, every area of this building. Fill every heart, oh God. Meet every need, oh Lord. We pray and ask in Jesus' name that you will move like never before. Have your way in this service, O oh Lord. Let your will be done in our lives and in the lives of those that are watching via YouTube and Facebook. Lord, we love you, we honor you, we glorify you, we magnify you. And it is to you alone, you and only you, that deserve all the glory, honor, and praise. So we thank you this morning. We ask that you are blessed, our pastor, the man of God, as he brings forth the word this morning. Lord, touch him. Breathe afresh upon him and let the word transform our hearts and minds that we would live boldly and walk in the things in which you have been prepared for us in Jesus' name this morning. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Hallelujah. Well, yes, indeed, we have come to worship and to praise our God. Amen. Hallelujah. The word of God admonishes us to trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not into our own understanding, but in all of our ways to acknowledge him. And he will do what? He will direct our paths. Amen. And why is that? Because without him, we can do nothing. Without him. There is no us. Without him, there is no you. Without him, there is no me. Hallelujah. So this song just says, without you, Lord. Hallelujah. We make that declaration this morning and say, without you, Lord, we can do nothing. But with you, we can do all things. Come on and say, without you.
Hallelujah. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy of all honor and all glory yes, and all praise. All praise. Good morning to those of you this morning that have joined us live. And to those of you who have watched us through Facebook and YouTube, God bless you this morning. Let me just pause just for a moment before we get into the word. I want to thank uh, Deaconess Stephanie. Uh, uh, Latoya Jennings Boy, and also uh, Heron from Mason dude, on the uh, 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 fellowship we had yesterday at Copeland's. Yeah. It was standing room only. <laughs> we had a wonderful time. Wonderful time. You know, there were some things that, that I wasn't pleased with. I didn't win, you know, from games and all of that, but, but it's okay. And we had some people who ate and ran, you know, and, but we had a wonderful time. We <laughs> had absolutely wonderful time. So thank God for you being with us uh, uh, yesterday. To our guests this morning, God bless you. Thank you for being here this morning. To Brother Alonzo, I've known Alonzo since he was a little boy. He's a he's a man now, and so good to see him. I walked in, I was so surprised to see him. So good to see you this morning. Look, you look great. If you would open your Bibles to the book of John, fifth chapter. I've been doing this teaching on, I like what our future looks like. I like what our future looks like. This is part three of I like what our future looks like. John, the fifth chapter, verses one through eight. It reads as follows. I'm reading the New Living Translation. After Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days, inside the city near the sheep, near the sheep gate was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches, crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool. When the water bubbles up, someone else always get there ahead of me. Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat and walk. Instantly, the man was healed. Yes. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. But this miracle happened on the Sabbath. So the Jewish leaders objected. Father, we thank you for you are a miracle working God. Your miracles are not just in the Bible, but your miracles are for us today, oh God. So we thank you, Father, for your word that gives life and gives life abundantly. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who lives within us, who guides us and leads us into all truth. Let us hide your word in our hearts that we might not sin against you. Father, hide me behind the cross, not by me, but all about you. Let no flesh glory in your presence. It is the spirit that quits it. The flesh pops up nothing, and the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. In Jesus' name, let the church say, Amen. Amen. My text this morning, again, is I like what my future looks like. Reset. You may be seated. Reset. Reset. We've covered a number of things. We've covered the fact that at this pool there were a bunch of impotent folk. There were a bunch of sick people. People who had been lying or uh, were lying around these five porches and they had been lying there waiting for the bubbling of the water to come so that they could walk in and get healed. These people were sick and tired of being sick and tired. These people were sick and tired of life, and these people were, had problems. And we said before that, that God uses, in the Bible, Jesus uses these type of physical ailments to show metaphorically what, how we're stuck spiritually. Amen. See, many of us are stuck spiritually and don't realize that we're stuck spiritually. And so what God wants to do is God wants to move us from being unstuck. God wants to move us to a different place. So the first one we looked at was people who were sick, people who were impotent, people who were sick. Then the next one we looked at were people who were blind, people who had no physical sight. But we're blind as well because we have vision, we have sight, but we have no vision. And it's our vision that leads us to our future. And if we don't have vision, we can't have a future. And what the enemy would do is he would try to steal our vision so we have no future. God wants us to be able to see so that we can have a future, and God has a future for us. Amen? Amen? This morning, what we want to look at is the third person, and that's the one who's lame. The person who is lame. A person who is crippled or disabled. A person uh, disabled in some way. They may have injured their foot, and so they walk They walk with a limp. And it's hard for them to stand up because that foot, there's something wrong with that foot. But not only are we looking at people who are lame physically, who are unstable, 
But we're also looking at people who are lame in their thinking. They become crippled in their thinking. Some of us have become crippled in our thinking. And what we've done is we've carried over 2022, the lameness of our thinking in 2023. God wants to get us to live and set free from the lameness of our thinking. So these people would not allow any new ideas or thoughts to permeate their minds. So they were robbed of any faith actions. Because we look at themselves, they become comfortable. They didn't think any miracles would ever take place. And they just looked at themselves that they were just where they were. And they were going to be like that for the rest of their lives. And, and, and that was one perspective that had been introduced to them. But they want to open their minds up for other perspectives. So this made them unstable. So they needed support physically as well as mentally. So they were unstable and they were unbalanced and so they were stuck in their lameness. When we're growing up, people refer to those who were not like them as being lame. You can say something and somebody say, you're just lame. You're just lame. Why? Because you didn't think the way they thought. Well, God says we're lame because we don't think the way he thinks. Amen? Amen. So that connotation on it will say to us, because I never want to be called lame. I never want to say, you, Gary, you're just lame. No, because I want to be, you know, back in the holiday, we want to be hip. We want to be everyone with the in crowd. We want everybody to look at us as being, I don't want to be lame. That, was, that raised a connotation somewhat of, of an emotion. So I started trying to figure out, how can I not start to be hip like everybody else is hip? You know what happens? God will set us aside. I don't care how much you try to fit in, how much I try to fit in, we're always going to be lame. Because God says, that's not the path that I have for you. Many times, even, even, even today, there are things that we may try to fit into, but God won't let us fit into them. We won't be with people who are uh, maybe, you know, people who are well-liked. But we can't get in with that crowd because there's something about us. And I like to say it like this. God has lavishly loved us, marked us. Since he has lavishly marked us, we can never fit in. And so we find sometimes ourselves saying, well, I'm lonely because I don't have any friends because I'm just lame. No, you're not lame. You're just lavishly marked and loved by God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Here's what we don't understand is that, that uh, we don't have to accept this lame thinking that we're going to be stuck the way we are. So we brought over from 2022 <clears throat> into 2023 uh, this lame thinking and nothing has changed. So the question is, I have for you this morning is, have we become crippled in our thinking? Have we become crippled in our thinking? Go to the book of Acts. This is where we're going to focus this morning, the book of Acts, the third chapter of Acts. I'm going to read verses 1 through 11. Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the 3 o'clock prayer. That means they had multiple prayer services. <laughs> this was the 3 o'clock prayer service. I mean, people think people don't want to come to the morning prayer or the late afternoon prayer. It's certainly not going to come to a three o'clock prayer. All right. okay. Amen. As they approach the temple, a man lay lame from birth, being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw people, Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, look at us. The lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. Get up. Get up and walk. I don't have no money to give you, but there's a name that I can give you. Then Peter took the lame man, the lame man, by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. Then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. All of the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. When they realized he was the lame beggar they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. They all rushed out in amazement to Solomon's colonnade, where the man was holding tightly to Peter and to John. These people going into the temple around the 3 o'clock time, God had a time set aside just for something special to take place. Do you know that God has a special time for each and every one of us called Kairos in God's time? If you think about uh, 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 Sarah, there was a specific time when she would have a child. Rachel was a specific time. God has time set aside in each one of our lives for something special to happen. 
God knows the end from the beginning and everything from the things that are yet to come. God knows every day what's going to happen in each and every day. God knows. Amen? So here it is. Three, here they are. Three o'clock. Time set aside for God for something special to uh, occur. I like to say that like God has a calendar of events. Every single day there's a calendar of events. So as they approached the temple, that was his man. The Bible says that he was lame from birth. He had never walked in his life. Never walked in his life. So he was born with a physical defect. But the thinking was that there was no way to overcome it. As a man thinking, so is he. As a man thinking, so is he. Many times there are things that affect us, and we think there's no way to overcome it, but God has a way to overcome it, if we believe and trust in him. So God is able to do the impossible. We just have to trust in him and not lean to our own understand, and understand it. So God is removing the defects in people's lives each and every day, but these people had seldom their thinking and they had accepted his defect. How many of us can look around us and see things that we don't necessarily like, defects in our lives, you let defects in other people's lives, but we do absolutely nothing about it. Mm -hmm. We just accept it the way it is. Amen? Everyone had, had given up. No one had ever seen uh, anyone get better in a situation like this, so they just accepted it. They said, look, I can't, I can't raise them up, so let's just accept it the way it is. Mm -hmm. Amen. I, I got I got a friend, a friend who is a result of a teenage pregnancy. Mm -hmm. She's fifty years old now, yeah. and she was uh, raised. Her mother raised uh, lived in the projects, so she got pregnant, and it was in her senior year in high school. You know how it was back in those days when when that kind of thing happened. It just meant your future was decimated. You got pregnant. You lived in the projects. Nothing good's gonna happen. You just join everybody else and what they're doing, and you just become like they are. Amen? Mm. No one gets out of that situation. Mm. It's just more babies and more government assistance. Mm. You, you've heard that. You've seen that. Uh -huh. She listened. She finished her class. She graduated on time. And when she walked across that stage, she walked across with her baby in her arms. My love. So they asked her, what are you going to do? Because they were expecting her to say, well, I'm going to get a job, and I'm just going to live like everybody else lives. I'm going to get my own place over here and, and, and live like everybody else lives. No, she said, I'm going to college. Mm. So she went to college, graduated from college, and uh, not only she graduated from college, but she went on and got her master's degree, and now she got a master's, then she got a doctorate degree, and now she got a doctorate, she became superintendent of the public school system in Florida. My love. See, see, people think that because something happens in your life, that is a defect. They think that that's all, that's all there is to it, that there's no way you can overcome it. And you, you, you get to that point where, you know, you start thinking, well, because I'm like everybody else, I'm going to do the same thing they're doing. God said, when you like that, you're lame and crippled in your thinking. He said, I can raise you up. He's the one that raised them up from the dung. Oprah Winfrey is Oprah Winfrey because God raised Oprah Winfrey up. God raised each and every one of us up. If we become something in the sight of man, it's because God does it. Amen? God does that. So she worked her way through various jobs in the school system and I said became superintendent of the Florida school system. And not, not only that, but each one of her three children have graduate degrees. See, she could have sat like everybody else and just sat there like at the pool of a Bethesda, just sitting around thinking that nothing's going to happen. Just because you have to limp don't mean that you can't recover. Amen? So a mistake is not necessarily the end. It just, unless you, unless, you, unless you make it the end, unless you see it as the end. And just because it was that for your, some of your family members doesn't mean it has to be your destiny. It doesn't have to be your destiny. Amen? So this man was carried to the temple every day, and he was put beside the temple gate so that he can beg. I got three observations for you. Listen very closely to this. No one ever carried him into the temple. They carried him to the gate. For him to beg, which means that they had become lame and they're thinking everybody was sitting around watching. They were going into the temple, That's right. but he was set out to beg. That's right. Something's wrong with that. Has the church and the people of God lost his focus and his power to bring in the sick and Amen. evangelize? Have we lost our focus and our power? Amen? Are we bringing the true word to people either in person or virtually. Amen? So it, it's easy to text someone the word. It's easy to text someone. It's easy to tell somebody to go look at something on Facebook or, or YouTube, isn't it? it? It's easy. And it's the word that will heal them. 
So it was a word that, I don't know about you, but it was a word that got me free. It was a word that delivered me from all the stuff that I was in. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I know my stuff wasn't no, couldn't have been much worse than your stuff. It got you healed and got you delivered and got you set free. Amen? So it was a word that got us delivered. We were at one time like, like the church at Philadelphia. The church at Philadelphia was a church that, that, that <coughs> was filled with brotherly love and, and it, 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 it ministered to the community. We were like that at one time, ministered to the laws and people around the world, but we're no longer like the church of Philadelphia. So the question is, does Christ grieve over his bride and her lack of service and purpose? And we lost focus on our service and our purpose. The second point, uh, observation I want to make is, it's assumed that people going to the church are the most loving and giving people in the world. Mm -hmm. it's, it's assumed that those of us that come into the church every Sunday, we're the most loving and the most caring people and the most giving people in the world. We're the ones that's full of compassion. Amen. Oh, Amen. Amen. Well, if that was the case, then why one why that man was set outside the church every single Sunday, every single every single day. But not only that, if they were so loving and so giving, why did he have to come every day? Because if they were so loving and so giving, they would have been giving him so much that he wouldn't have to come but once a week, maybe or once a month. So what we should be doing, we should be sharing what we have because. We're supposed to share one of those birds based on the book of Galatians 6 chapter. We're supposed to bear one of those birds. Amen? Amen. So Proverbs 19, 17 says this. He that lendeth to the poor, lendeth to the Lord, and the Lord will repay. Mm. So the Bible tells us that when we give of what God has given to us, that God will repay us. It is our responsibility to take care of those in need. It's our responsibility to do that. It's not the government's responsibility. It's became de facto the government's responsibility. But it should be us taking care of people. So God has blessed us, and we think, here's what we say. No, everything God given to me is for me. Everything God given to me is for me. It's not for anybody else. I'm not going to give anybody anything because I worked hard. I earned this myself. So I'm not giving anybody anything else. You, I got mine. You get yours. But he says, you bear, you're blessed to be a blessing. I'm blessed to be a blessing. Amen? The third observation is this. No one seems to have faith for his healing. People going to church on this so they have faith. We come to church every Sunday, but do we actually have faith? Amen? So they, we enjoy hearing the word, but walking in faith is a different way of thinking. It's a different way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Amen? So we're calling on God, expecting our faith to work for us. But they did not exercise any faith at all when it came to this man. Now keep in mind that they had just received the Holy Spirit, and they had just been due with power from on high, and they still didn't believe in faith. They had no faith to believe that the Holy Spirit could work a miracle. So is this the way we are today? Is this the way we, we, we believe that, that uh, <clears throat> although the Holy Spirit lives within us, we have no power to do anything? I know people laughed at me last week when I said my watch was broken, so I kind of tapped on it for the work. Yeah, I'm going to take it to the shop. I did, but I exercised my faith nonetheless. Mm -hmm. If I got a headache, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, before I take a Tylenol or Advil or something like that, I'm going to ask God to heal me first. I'm going to do it that way. Then I have believed that through the medicine I take will heal me. But I'm exercising my faith nonetheless. And we need to be able to exercise our faith because we want to exercise our faith. We don't know whether it works or not. If you never go to the gym, if you never do an exercise, how do you expect your muscles to grow? They won't grow. you got to do something. you got to exercise. Amen? Now, now, so they had this man sitting there every single day. But by contrast, if you look in the book of Mark, second chapter, go, go there real quick. Mark, the second chapter. When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was standing was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. So he dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. You see that? Right in front of Jesus. Now these people would carry this man to the temple every day, 
But these people exercised their faith. They saw, knew that Jesus was there, so they went and took the roof. Look, took the roof off. They used to be a song, blow the roof off. You know, you know that's song I can all I said, but you remember that song. Take the roof off. Take the roof off. Yeah, so they take the roof off. They took the roof off. And they lowered him down. Right in front of Jesus. And Jesus was singing. But Jesus saw it. Jesus said, Jesus knew they had faith to believe. Uh, I brought some of y'all back to the old days to, to take the roof off. Huh? I ain't say all, I won't say all of it, but you know the song. You know the song. Their friends brought him there. Amen. See, see, see. Jesus, seeing their faith, healed him. No one carried this man in, into the temple. Thank God for those that do God's work outside of the four walls in the church. I got a friend who's a pastor, and most of his ministry is not within the walls of the church. His ministry is in Walmart. He'll go to Walmart, stay in Walmart. Two or three hours. Mm -hmm. And he'll walk around and find people that he can pray for. Mm -hmm. And that's his ministry. He said, you know, I, yeah, yeah, I preach on Sundays. He said, but but, but for me, it's out being, talking to people, just walking up to people, you know, just, just impromptu, and just sharing the word of God with them. Mm -hmm. So they can be healed and delivered. Amen? Amen. And then the last point I want to make this observation is this. Uh, this man had become stuck in wanting handouts. And had no desire to do anything else. He was comfortable. Amen. He was comfortable with himself. Mm -hmm. He wasn't saying, he didn't raise his hand and say, Will somebody carry me into a temple? Isn't something going on there? Aren't some healings taking place in there? Will somebody just help me out? No, he himself had got comfortable with whatever handouts he was getting. So we'll go back to the book of the Apostles, third chapter. In third verse. The Bible says that when Peter and John were about to enter, he asked them for some money. Mm -hmm. He didn't say, can y'all take, somebody take me inside? He asked them for some money. Why? Because that's what he was used to. He was so lame in his thinking, that's what he had become used to. Mm -hmm. Peter and John looked at him, the Bible says, and they said to them, look on us. He was expecting them to give him, give him some money. But he said, Peter said this, he said, I don't have any silver gold. Mm -hmm. He said, but what I give you, what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, he said, get up and walk. Up. Then Peter took his hand and extended his hand to him and helped him up. As he did that, the Bible says his feet, his ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. Listen, he didn't go through what we go through naturally. He didn't go through us crawling. He didn't go through us scooting first and then crawling. No, the Bible says this man jumped up and he started walking immediately because a miracle had taken place. Peter said, look, Peter said, I don't have any money. He said, but what I do have, he said, the name will help you. The name, the name, the name, the name will help you. He said, I have a name that, that you can put in your bosom, a name that you can put it in your bosom, a name that's not associated with alcohol, not associated with drugs, not associated with sex. He says, not associated with a lottery, not associated with medicine. It's the name that's above every name. He said, I got a name for you. And this name is going to help you. It's not the money. I don't have any money to give you, but I got a name for you. It's that name. It's that name that brings peace, that name that brings healing, that name that brings deliverance to our soul. It's a name that causes demons to flee from us. And so we are free to call upon that great name. And, and Jesus. Uh, that name that's above every name. Mm -hmm. And when he said that, everything shifted. Yeah. Yeah. Everything shifted. Shift. Everything shifted. Shift. But Peter extended his hand to help. Peter extended his hand to help. Listen, when Peter extended his hand, it was God's grace being extended. It was God's grace being extended. God's grace. Sometimes you and I just need somebody to extend a hand. Sometimes we need somebody to just reach out. Sometimes you may just need somebody to talk to. Sometimes you may need somebody just to listen to what's going on in your life. He extended a hand. and How many times people are extending their hands, but we don't have time for them. We don't have time. We don't have time. Peace, I got a name. But not only do I have a name for you, I'm going to extend my hand to you. See, we can lead people to Christ. We can. We can lead them to Christ. But sometimes they need to be helped. That's right. 
Sometimes they need to be lifted up from where they are because they're crippled and lame in their thinking. There's hope in the name of Jesus. So these guys' mind off this disability because Jesus will take our minds off our disability. He'll take our minds off our disability. This was a reset in his mind. This was a paradigm shift. This was unusual thinking. Everybody that saw this man jump up and leap, they looked at him and said, whoa, what's going on? But they know something. He's holding tight on the Peter's hand. Holding tight. Holding tight on the Peter's hand. So a reset is, in this context, is a, a new way of thinking. And once his thinking was changed, he overcame his disability. Sometimes people need to be, can get unstuck just by us. Just paying attention to them. Amen. Just listening. I had a lady call me. She's in her 80s. I used to work with her years ago. She said this to me. She said, uh, I know it won't be many years hence that I'm going to die. She said, I got all these sicknesses happening in my life. And she said, I'm calling you because I want you to know something. I want you to know that I want you to speak at my funeral. Not for me to do a eulogy, but for me to just talk about the time I worked with you some 30 years ago. She said, because you can do that better than anybody else. And I said, yeah. I said, I have no problem doing that. But I also said this to her. I'm coming to visit you. See, she's at a place where she says there's no hope for me. And, and I'm saying to you, to her, I'm extending my hand. I'm extending my hand. I'm coming to visit you. Really, I'm coming to visit you. I'm coming to visit you. I'm telling you, I'm coming to visit you. I want to see you. I want to spend time with you. Sometimes people just want you to spend some time with them. When my children call on me and want to talk, I just listen. Sometimes whatever they're going through, I may not know what they're going through. And I'm not going to preach to them. I just need to understand what they're going through and then just listen. I'm extending my hand. That's the grace of God. Because what God does is, God just listens to us. This morning from 6 30, 7 30, I was in prayer. God just listened. God just listened. God was extending his grace. Extending his grace. But I want you to understand this. There was a part that Peter played, but there was also a part that the man played. They believed for their healing, they had to believe that there was power in the name. Do you believe that there's power in the name? Because if you don't believe there's power in the name, there's no need to mention the name. Nothing's going to change for you. You've got to believe that there's power in the name. I was having lunch with my cousin a couple of weeks ago. He told me a story about an accident that happened. He said that I was four, he's four years old. He's riding in the car with his uncle. He knows a gun slide from under the seat. So being a four-year-old child, what do you do? You pick the gun up. When you pick the gun up, what do you do? He pulled the trigger. Now, he could have shot both people in the front seat, but the gun was so heavy that when he pulled the trigger, it hit his leg. And so he rushed him to the hospital. And he gets to the hospital, what the doctor say? Now, this is 56 years ago. What did they say? Because the medicine won't like it today, we're going to have to amputate your leg. See, that's the kind of thinking there is. There's only one way, there's no other way. Just one way to do it. And so, so the mom and everybody said, no, don't, don't, don't take his leg, don't take his leg. The doctor said, there's no other way. If you don't, it doesn't matter. He's gonna walk with a limp the rest of his life. They said, well, he'll walk with a limp the rest of his life, but don't take his leg, he's four years old. He had a granddad. He had a granddad that said, I don't believe my grandson is gonna limp the rest of his life. So the granddad did something that's unusual. He designed this uneducated man designed exercises for his grandson on the wall every day. Every day, all different kinds of exercises, bending, helping him to walk. And everybody was looking at the granddad like he's crazy. Nothing's gonna change. Doctors have already spoken and said that he'll walk with the limp the rest of his life. He's four years old. Through that therapy, we call it therapy. We didn't know what it was, he didn't know what it was back then, but it was therapy. They have programs today that you go to when you got problems with your legs. You have a knee replacement, they'll give you therapy. 
You hurt your back, they give you therapy. He had therapy 56 years ago. A year later, he was walking without a limb. He didn't care what the family members thought. He didn't care what the doctors thought. He didn't care what the community thought. He believed that God would heal him. He exercised his faith. That was his thinking. It wasn't a lame thinking, the crippled thinking. It was a different kind of thinking. Five years old, one year later, he went to kindergarten. Started school a long time. 56 years ago, from that day to this day, he never had a problem ever. He walked just like I walk, upright. No, no, no luck whatsoever. See, when you believe God for change, when you, when you trust him, lean out to your own understanding, God will do it. God will do it. God will change our minds. He'll change our way of thinking because when he starts affecting our hearts, it affects our thinking. It causes us to see things from God's point of view, not from man's point of view. I'm about to get lit. Amen. I'm about to get lit in this place. Because I recognize the goodness of God. I recognize who he is. God can rough, smooth out the rough places. God can do that. God can call the crooked path to be straight. God can do that. That's never too hard for our God. If we submit and trust in him, God will do it. God will do it. The name that's above every name. The name that's above every name. All you got to do is call upon that name. The name that's above every name. The name that's above every name. Every name. Have you seen him work in people's lives? Have you seen him work in people's lives? Have you seen him work in your life? That's your testimony. Not just in your life, but when you see it work in somebody else's life, it all changed the way we think. Goodbye, ladies of 2022. We welcome a new way of thinking in 2023. I'm going to give you four strategies, and we're going to come to a conclusion. Four strategies to consider to help you overcome lame thinking. One is this. Have faith in God. Based on Mark 11, 23, 24. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Believe that God can move the mountain, whatever the mountain is, cancer, financial problem, marriage problem, children problem, whatever the problem is, know that God can remove the mountain from your life. God can do it. Have faith in God. Have faith in him. Second one is this. Identify what caused you to become lame in the first place and reset your thinking. Was it generational? Was it environmental? Or is it spiritual? Generational, environmental, or spiritual. I met a guy in the gym, and he was telling me a story about somebody he had met in the gym. And I see the guy in the gym regularly. And when I say this, I want to make sure you understand what I'm saying here. He's talking to this young man who was a smart young man, smart, had a degree from uh, one of the good colleges here in Georgia, a degree in biochemical engineer or something like that. He said he's working in a factory down the coast. And, and he said, he asked me, he said, why are you working in a factory company? Nothing wrong with, with a good job. I'm not talking about that. But because of his, 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 his intelligence and because of, of uh, uh, the degree, he thought that he could get a job working for as a chemist or doing something like that. He said, well, the reason why I like it is because my granddad was here. My dad was here. My uncle was here. See, sometimes these things we just do because somebody else has done it in our family. And we said we can't do it anymore even though we have the tools to do it well. No, God says I can bring you up from that. He's the one that opens every door. We open the door, no man can shut it. When you shut it, no man can open it. The third one is this. Pull down strongholds. If the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, verses 4 through 5, pulling down strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to obedience of Christ. Pulling down strongholds mean that they can be pulled down. Yes, if you said pull them down, pull them down. Yes, they can be pulled down. Strongholds that grab us and keep us from moving forward cause us to stay stuck right where we are. The fourth one is this, and the last one is this. Philippians 2.5 says, develop the mind of Christ. If you want to be unstuck, you don't want to be lame in your thinking, 
develop the mind of Christ. Let Christ's thoughts become our thoughts. Let his thoughts become our thoughts. And how do we do that? Through his word. If you draw close to him, he'll draw close to us. Read his word. Let it dwell in us and apply it to our lives. Amen? Amen. This man experienced a reset on this day. And today, you can receive a reset. Amen? Today, you can receive a reset. You can change your thinking today about your situation, <laughs> about life in general. And the Holy Spirit has come to help us to do a reset, to do a paradigm shift in our lives. God can do that. You can reset today. And resets are not always easy. It may mean that we have to step outside of our comfort zone. It may mean we have to do something different. It may mean that it may cause us some trouble. It may require some energy. It may require some effort. But God says you can have a reset. Through his Holy Spirit, we can have a reset through him. God wants, don't want us to be lame. God wants us to know that the impossible can be done through him. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen. amen. Thank you, Lord, for the reset. Amen. Hallelujah. In you we live, we move, and we have our being. Amen. Indeed, we are nothing without you, Lord. <coughs> huh. Thank you, Lord.
you this morning and we worship you. We enter into your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. For this is the day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We pray blessings over our church family, our Facebook family, YouTube family, and people all over this world. Thank you, Father, for our pastor, Pastor Gary Turner, and the word that he brought forth this morning. I like my future, what my future looks like. So, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that we not be blinded, crippled, or lame in our thinking. I pray, Father, that we be filled with love and compassion one for another. We make a declaration that we will stretch out our hands to help others in need. I pray, Father, that we have faith for healing, deliverance, favor, and blessings. I pray that you will, we will not be complacent and or comfortable in uncomfortable situations, but we will trust and believe you because we can trust in you with all our heart and lean not into our own understanding. In all your ways, you will, we acknowledge you. You said you will direct our plan. We decree and declare we will have faith in God. We will reset. We will pull down strongholds. We will develop the mind of Christ and not be blinded by circumstances and or situations. We decree and declare that because there is power in the name of Jesus, because there is power in your name, we can decree a thing and it shall be established in our lives. So Father, we thank you. We like what our future looks like. In Jesus' name, amen.